Order. The sitting is resumed and it's time for questions. And the Minister is in time for questions. Minister of the Environment, and we will start with listed questions. And could I inform members that questions 2 and 8 have been withdrawn? I call Ms. Bronwyn McGahan. As I have stated on a number of occasions in this Assembly, I am committed to ensuring that the 11 new councils will work within the governance framework that provides for fair, transparent and efficient decision-making and protects the rights and interests of all people. Members will know from the debate on the consideration stage of the Local Government Bill on the 18th and 19th of March that the Bill includes the provisions required to give legislative effect to my commitment. Proportionality in the allocation of positions of responsibility across all the political parties represented on the Council will be ensured through a Council's use of one of the methods specified in the Bill. The Member will be aware that the methods that I am making available are the DeHaunt, the St. Lag divisor methods or the single transferable voting system. As agreed by the Assembly during the Bill's consideration stage, the DeHaunt method is specified as the default approach if a Council is unable to agree the method to be used. Provision is also made in the Bill to ensure that the membership of committees reflects, as far as is practicable, the political balance on the Council. I have also introduced a call-in procedure to allow a number of councillors to join together to request that a decision under executive arrangements or a recommendation for ratification by the Council under a committee system is reviewed. The call-in procedure would enable 15 per cent of the membership of a Council to request the review of a decision in specified circumstances. A further protection for the interests of minority communities in council decision-making is the introduction of qualified majority voting for a range of strategic council decisions that will be specified in regulations and in response to a valid call-in request on the grounds of disproportionate adverse impact of a section of the community in the council's district. The support of 80 per cent of members present and voting will be required for such decisions to be agreed. Thank you. Uh, Ms McGahan for a supplementary. Gurmi, I, I thank the Minister for his response, and you have touched on my supplementary question, but can I ask the Minister, can he give assurances that this issue will be monitored very closely? Excuse me, uh, I'm sorry for being late. I would certainly uh, give the member assurances that this will be monitored very closely, not just by my department, but one would imagine by this Assembly as a whole. I think, and it's evident through the debate today and at the consideration stage, that the House is receptive of these measures that have been brought forward, these safeguards that have been brought forward, and also, I suppose, the safeguards that come with them to ensure that what, what is here to protect minorities isn't then used to block progress uh, unnecessarily of the, the work of councils, but it will be closely monitored and will be subject to close scrutiny. Thank you. And I call Mr. Gregory Campbell. Uh, thank the Minister for his response. But he talked about the default position in terms of minority protection. Um, how will he safeguard issues, particularly around the border, where some communities may feel that they could be disadvantaged because they're in a minority position and they find that the hunt is actually not the preferred position to try and safeguard their position, but they find themselves being blocked by others who know that they insist on, uh, on trying to go another route, knowing that they will have the default position of the hunt to fall back on. Uh, thank the, the, the member for that su supplementary question. I said the bill itself does contain safeguards, one of which we, we, we are talking about, and another which the, the, the member raises a, a valid question about. I think it is incumbent upon all of us as elected representatives and, and, and leaders, if you like, to allay concerns of communities and to work with councillors from our own parties and from all parties to ensure that they operate as fairly as possible so that uh, the views of not just their citizens but their elected representatives from all hues are re reflected in the makeup of committees and in positions of, of responsibility in the new councils. I call Mr. Pat Ramsey. 
Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister further to the position of the hunt and the mathematical formula? In terms of what is encompassed within the protection contained within the Local Government Bill to ensure that power sharing is enshrined within the Bill and responsibilities and positions within each Council? Well, uh, this was the subject of some debate at, at the consideration stage of this Bill, the importance of sharing power, the importance of giving smaller parties and indeed independents the opportunity to hold uh, positions of responsibility that they are not unfortunately afforded in the, the current system. <laughs> one method of doing so and one that is enshrined in the bill is that the allocation of positions of responsibility, special responsibility, will be carried out at the start of the Council's four-year term. And if the haunt is the default position for the allocation of these positions, it will be run for the four years at, at that time. This will obviously give opportunities to smaller parties and independents, as I've said, that, that they, don't, uh, they don't currently have. I call Ms. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Deputy. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, um, as, as you know, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, the Alliance Party put forward uh, during consideration stage um, STV as the default position rather than the haunt. Uh, would the Minister not agree with me that STV is actually a better um, mechanism for sharing of, uh, of power? I uh, thank uh, the Chair of the Committee for her question. Unfortunately, I would not <laughs> agree with her, as I did not agree with her, as indeed this Assembly did not agree with her at the last stage of the Local Government Bill. Uh, in fact, it was, I think, illustrated quite clearly by Mr Weir, I think it was, that the haunt was actually uh, the method that would be more favourable to smaller parties uh, with the new mechanism of allocating positions of responsibility at the start of the four-year term. And I call Mr. Tom Elliott. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Given the potential minister for, for gridlock with the call-in and qualified majority uh, processes, how do you feel both of those aspects will impact on the day-to-day -day running and decision-making of local councils? Well, local government reform is about making local government more effective and more efficient. So the last thing we want to be doing is creating a tool that will lead to gridlock. As the member puts it, regulations will be made under clause 37 of the bill that specify mandatory elements that must be contained in the council's standing orders. One of these elements will be the process to be followed for the practical operation of the call-in procedure. The regulations will also specify those decisions of a council that will not be subject to the call-in procedure. These will be decisions connected with regulatory or quasi-judicial functions and responsibilities of a council, for example, licensing decisions <coughs> or those decisions may be relating to development control. My officials have worked in partnership with senior officers from local government to develop the detail of the proposed process, including details on timeframes for receipt of a call-in request after a decision or recommendation has been notified to the councillors, and the administrative procedures to be followed by officers and the role of councillors in this process. The draft standing orders regulations will be issued for consultation later on this week, actually. Thank you. I call Mr Phil Flanagan. Question number three. Uh, with your permission, uh, I will uh, take questions three and six together and would be grateful, as I'm doing so, to get maybe a wee bit of extra time. <laughs> uh, as the Northern Ireland Minister responsible for the environment, I have made my position clear. Granting permissions relating to fracking operations will only take place when it has been supported by very strong evidence which indicates that fracking is safe for public health and the environment. To do otherwise, given the scale of ongoing worldwide research, would be reckless and irresponsible. 
I have directed my officials in the NIEA to work with the Environmental Protection Agency in Ireland to take forward a major programme of research to help establish the facts and safety issues associated with frac fracking. This programme of research is currently at the tender evaluation stage. I would also highlight that no decisions have been taken in relation to permitting fracking. No planning applications or applications for environmental permissions have yet been received by my department. My department will consider any applications which may come forward in the future in a very robust manner. The hydraulic fracturing process has generated much debate here and around the world because of the potential detrimental impact on the environment particularly in relation to water quality, air emission issues, seismic impacts, as well as general personal and public health concerns raised by communities. In an attempt to allay these concerns, specific divisions within my department, primarily planning and the NIEA, are actively working to enhance their knowledge of the fracking process by assessing emerging research which includes case studies from other parts of the world and liaising with colleagues in other environment agencies in Britain and Ireland and other countries where fracking is currently proposed or taking place. I would just uh, emphasise again to the member, I do have a longer answer here and I'm conscious that you are giving me a wee bit more time, but I would need a lot more time to get through this answer, but just <laughs> emphasise to the member uh, my position once again, and that's in the absence of evidence that this is safe and sustainable, that I, I would not be approving any application to do it. Again, I'll come to Flanagan for a supplement. Gormega, the free last I thank the, the Minister, but Minister, surely there's enough evidence out there now to allow you to make a decision that fracking is not in our best interest. Um, that's either economically or environmentally, and the report you're talking about from the EPA doesn't even look at the, the, the health aspects of fracking. But can I ask the Minister if he was going to, to give financial advice to, to people around the world considering in investing in Tamboran, does he think it would be a prudent financial investment for somebody to, to invest money in that company, or would they be better keeping their money in their pockets? Well, I think that's one you'd be better asking the Minister for finance. He might be better placed to give financial advice than me. I have to also uh, inform the member that I can't predetermine the outcome of any application, so I'm not in a position today to say that any application from fracking will be refused point blank, but it will be refused in the absence of the existence of the evidence that I have referred to earlier. As of yet, that evidence doesn't exist. You believe that there is sufficient evidence to the contrary for us to make a decision on, on fracking now, but it's up to the applicant and this type of application with any application to demonstrate that it is safe. I call Mr. Colin Meeswood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal, uh, Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for his answers thus far? Um, can I ask him, given that this has been a huge uh, issue of interest across the world and in America in particular, um, can he outline what meetings he's had both here and in the States uh, with different groups? I uh, thank the, the member for the question. This is an, an issue that has generated massive public interest. It's generated quite a degree of controversy, and I have had several meeting requests, and several meetings have done my best to, 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 to meet anyone who has requested to meet on this issue, and a lot of them have actually been constituents of <laughs> Mr. Flanagan's, although not solely. Uh, uh, this is something that stirs passion in people, not just in the immediate geographic area where that is being mooted as a potential site for this fracking. Uh, I've had meetings with, with constituents of his, such as a Dr. Carl, Carl O'Dolan and, and a, group, a representative group fr from that area, from a cross-section of the community, I have to say, and a cross-section of, of interests. More recently, I met with a, a lady, Marlon Trimble, and well, it was a group of six ladies, actually, and they were from right across the north, from, from different areas and different constituencies, but all with one uh, common concern around fracking. The member referred to the United States. I was in America a fortnight ago. I met with the EPA there on this issue. They have spent millions upon millions of dollars on research, and the evidence that they have is, in my opinion, inconclusive. 
and I'm not sure that it will ever be conclusive, nor that they, they wish it to be. Uh, I've also spoken with quite a number of politicians. They're from different areas, some with uh, different views to others on it. But uh, I'm always open to hearing other points of view, and I have heard from those who, who believe that fracking is a good thing as well. So it's important, I think, that we take on board all views when making any decision or consideration. Thank you, and I call Lord Morrow. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. I uh, listened with interest to what the ministers had to say in reply to Mr. Flanagan's question. Uh, I'd like to ask the minister if it transpires that after all these reports, of which I suspect there will be many, that it is satisfied that this is a cheaper and safer source of energy, what would your position be then, the minister? If. <laughs> Uh, and I call Mr. Stephen Agnew. Well, Deputy Speaker, um, the Minister has referred to if evidence comes forward about fracking being safe, and I just asked him um, to outline what he means by safe, because given the recent IPCC report and research coming out of University of Ulster that says if we're to avoid um, the most serious consequences of climate change, that, that gas must um, stay in the ground. Does he agree in terms of uh, assessment of climate impact that fracking can never be safe? If, <laughs> when, we talk, uh, when I refer to safe or safety or safeness, I refer to a, a range of, of issues. Personal and public health, obviously danger or risk to the planet and the environment. Uh, to which uh, Mr Agnew refers. These are all uh, issues that, that, that I consider whenever I speak of, of safety and the need to ensure that any application for any uh, such venture demonstrates that it is safe. And call Mr Leslie Cree. Principal Deputy Speaker, and the Minister will be aware of all the anecdotal information and misinformation. Uh, he does mention that his officials are looking at this. What steps and when do you think you'll have best international practice on the practice of actually fracking? I thank the member for the supplementary question. Yes, my officials are looking at this. They're doing so in partnership with the EPA and uh, the Republic. When will we be in a position to, to, to make this, this judgment? I'm not, not entirely sure. I will be getting a report back from this current piece of research next year or well the environment minister next year will be getting a report back on this however as i've outlined in an answer to mr uh, flanagan and mr eastwood i met recently with the environment protection agency in the united states who have spent many years and many more millions carrying out uh, research on this very subject and in my opinion still seem far from a conclusion on it Thank you. And I call Mr. Gregory Campbell. Number four. On the 7th of March 2014, I announced the launch of Round 3 of the Coastal Communities Fund. The Big Lottery Fund administered the fund on behalf of my department, and organisations seeking to apply to it are advised to check the Coastal Community Fund's webpage on the Big Lottery Fund website, where they will be able to access Stage 1 and stage two application forms, help notes, questions and answers, as well as other various guidance documents, such as guidance on measuring economic outcomes and state aid guidance. Applicants can also contact the Big Lottery Fund by telephone or email to find out if their project is eligible. In addition, in the case of capital projects, applicants can arrange a telephone interview before applying. The Big Lottery Fund organised an application workshop online seminar on the 18th of March with a focus on key requirements for capital projects involving land and buildings or other construction related work. Nine local organisations attended the webinar and the Big Lottery Fund has so far received 18 queries from 16 organisations seeking information and advice on round three of the fund which closes at midday on the 30th of April. 
Mr. Campbell, for a supplementary. Well, I thank the Minister for his response. Um, and he will obviously be aware that we have one of the most beautiful uh, coastlines in Western Europe, which we not only need to seek to uh, defend and improve uh, and promote, but that we need to see the communities that live there and uh, commute from and to there, uh, them being uh, enhanced and promoted in their attempt to defend that, uh, that coastline and that heritage. Will his department be actively canvassing for the Northern Ireland coastline with the big lottery so that the, the applications that are in stand a very good chance of success? I thank the member uh, for that supplementary question. Uh, the department, along with uh, the, the, the big lottery fund who are running this process with us and, or indeed for us, uh, will actively and have, I believe, I have outlined, actively engaged with communities across the north or from our coastal areas. I certainly concur with the member's assessment of the beauty of our coastline and indeed the need to preserve, protect and promote it. That's why I have actually this year alloc I've allocated three years budget this one year to attract, I hope, bids that display maybe more ambition than, uh, than you can get for your, the funding in a one year period. That we get more ambitious projects and actually give those responsible for carrying out the project more time to ensure that they are carried out and their full potential is met. Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I welcome the Minister's response uh, and his, particularly his uh, preserve, promote and protect. Um, my village in Kirkcobbin is a small coastal community and its harbour is disappearing into Strangford Loch. I would like to know if they, in the interest of the environment, would the Minister um, indicate his support for funding from the coastal communities uh, fund for to protect that small harbour in my village? I thank uh, the, 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 the member for his question. and I have received written correspondence from members in this House and indeed the, the, the House of Commons on, on this issue as well. Projects aimed at flood risk and, and indeed repair after floods are eligible if they support the coastal communities fund outcome of sustainable economic growth through the creation and safeguarding of jobs. So I certainly would not say no. However, any application to carry out such repair and maintenance would need to be, I believe, quite creative in, I suppose, who was to carry it out and how. I call Mr. Alban McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. I don't know whether the Minister is particularly happy with the level of applications, but is there any way that the Minister might suggest improving the awareness uh, of this fund? I thank the, the, the member for the, for the question. Well, I did allude to the fact that we have a bigger budget this time round. <laughs> I do think we have plenty of, app of applications as well, although the door is open uh, for applications until the 30th of April, and I, I, I look forward to a wide and varied selection of applications as, uh, as well. I uh, announced that the fund would open, I think I made that announcement in January, and then in March, on the 7th of March, I opened the fund and referred potential applicants to the Coastal Communities Fund website. There is, in my opinion, a wide awareness of the fund, as demonstrated by the 65 applications from all coastal council areas which have been received since the fund opened in 2012. They include proposals from Derry to Kilkeel, including Limavady and Coleraine, the Causeway Coast, Larne, Carrick Fergus, the Ards Peninsula, you'll be glad to hear, and Newcastle. Thank you. And I call Mr. Michael Majimsey. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question number five. In 2009, PricewaterhouseCoopers estimated that the cost of local government reform would be in the region of £118 million over five years. 
Further work has been undertaken since then. In 2013, my predecessor secured executive agreement to provide councils with a reform funding package of £17.8 million over the 2013 to 2015 period, based on the estimated costs of some elements of the reform programme to cover. £5.2 million for new councils in the shadow period, £4 million for systems convergence, £3.5 million for councillor severance, £3 million for capacity building, £1 million for change management, £0.6 million for staff induction, and £0.5 million for winding up existing councils. There was a commitment given for an additional £30 million for rates convergence post-2015. Over recent months, senior local government officers have undertaken a detailed financial assessment of those additional transitional work streams, which are both unavoidable and are not covered by the funding package provided by the executive. The four transition work streams identified that fall to councils to fund over the 2014 to 2018 period are staff severance, alignment of services, councils operating in shadow form, and other transition costs. A total upper limit for those costs likely to be incurred during the transition period, excluding the executive funding package, has been estimated at around £33 million. These costs have been calculated at a regional level and based on the transition cost data capture exercise completed by the local government sector. Mr. Majimsi, for a supplement. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for that comprehensive answer. And given uh, the very large investment that's going into reform, is the Minister confident uh, that uh, councils, as when they're established, will have the resources available to them? And will he have the resources available to him to invest in councils to ensure uh, that they can enforce? those regulations that fall to them uh, and, and those responsibilities, particularly on their issues around environmental protection, which we have talked about earlier, and ensuring that the normal council businesses in this area will not suffer uh, as a result of such large uh, demands on, on cash and revenue coming both from him and from the ratepayer. Uh, I thank the, the, the member for that supplementary question, and he quite rightly identifies that this is a huge investment. This isn't just, or sorry, the, the reform of local government isn't just about doing things differently. It's about doing things better. So I do want to assure the, the, the member that I am committed to ensuring that councils are equipped to do things better and indeed that my department and this assembly is equipped to ensure that councils are, are doing things better as well. Commissary Ian Mill. Brief last one, Collier. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, uh, will the DOE allow councils permissible forms of borrowing to fund uh, local government uh, reform? Gurmeel Mowat. Uh, I thank you for that supplementary question. Indeed, uh, we have been approached by some of the STCs around what scope will exist for the new councils when it comes to borrowing and, and how they can best meet these costs of transition. Uh, I am determined that we do everything we can to make this as easy as possible for the councils. And to that note, we have indeed given, permitted councils to have any borrowings they make in order to meet the cost of reform. They can have that capitalised, which is something that was very much being asked for by the local government sector. Now comes to John Dallet. Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, the Minister has taken some time to tell us about the costs. Now, bearing in mind that the uh, 11 council model was not his preferred choice. Can he tell the Assembly if there are actually any savings from it? Well, I'd like to think this is an investment to save. Uh, as, uh, uh, in my original answer, I outlined PwC's uh, appraisal that suggested that the cost of reform would be £118 million over five years. The same study suggested that we will achieve or can achieve savings of £438 million over 25 years. 
which is a huge saving indeed. And like I say, it's not just a co about cutting costs and about doing more things more efficiently. Uh, local government reform is about doing things better and bringing power closer to people. Thank you. In order that ends the period for oral questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And I call Mr. Thomas Buchanan. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what action his department has taken to ensure that the area plans are brought up to speed in line with the new Super Council uh, areas? I thank the, the, the member for that question. Area plans are extremely important documents. We, we usually talk about one in particular in this House. I'll be glad to speak about area plans more generally. Uh, I believe local government reform offers a tremendous opportunity to new councils when it comes to actually sitting down with uh, my officials from planning and drawing up their new area plans. Indeed, work has already commenced on area plans within the 11 new council clusters. A Grade 6 planning manager has been appointed to lead the work programme across the province. Principal planning officers have also been appointed in each area office. The teams will be supported by I think, five or six staff per council cluster. The department had hoped the teams would be fully staffed at this stage. However, there has been some delay, but staff are currently being appointed to take part in this process. The development plan staff have already met with most of the transition management teams of councils to discuss council priorities and agree a forward work programme for this year. And this work, importantly, is being taken forward, adopting a collaborative approach with planning staff, local councils and DSD. The preparation of the area plan will provide the future framework for councils to shape their area and inform their planning decisions in the future, so it's an extremely important piece of work. Mr Buchanan, for supplementary. Thank you, uh, Mr. D Principal Deputy Speaker. And I do note the Minister says about the area plans that they're an important document. Given that the area plan for Roma has been out of date for the past 14 years and that it was up in 2002, can the Minister give us any indication as to when the new area plan for the Oma and Fermanagh Council will be in place? How many years are we going to have to wait until we get that document? I like, like to think that the dates on the current uh, area plans are more best before dates rather than used by dates. Uh, but I have uh, given the assurance to members in, in the House that work is already underway in the preparation of these plans. Obviously, the timescale for the finalisation of these plans will be determined by the new councils and their determination to, 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 to get these done. I can imagine that it's something the councils will be keen to get done as quickly as possible, and uh, many of them, I would imagine, will be commencing work very soon in, in their shadow period on this very important piece of work, given the, the importance it has to the area in terms of future housing provision, economic development, retention of, of areas of special scientific interest and, and natural beauty. It's extremely important work, and I'm sure the new councils will agree and, and treat it accordingly. Thank you. And I call Mr Mervyn Storey. Thank you, Mr Deputy Principal Speaker. I'm going to take the Minister from the wilds of Fermanagh and Tyrone to uh, the North Antrim coast. Uh, I'm sure a journey that he would enjoy. Uh, in terms of the answer that he gave earlier in relation to the uh, Coastal Community Fund, can the Minister give an assurance that the island of Rathlin will be fully engaged with the process and given its strategic importance uh, in regards to many elements of the tourist industry but particularly for the people who live on the island uh, could he give us an update as to maybe how the community fund the coastal fund in relation to Rathlin will be of benefit to that community well i am not entirely sure how Rathlin have been engaged in the process to date although i very much imagine that they have been. I uh, will we'll, we'll check that as soon as I leave the chamber tonight or tomorrow morning, maybe by the time we get through lo local government. Uh, the member quite rightly outlines the importance of Rathlin to tourism in the north, and I 
counter to that, fully appreciate the importance of tourism to Rathlin. I, I, I know there are issues there currently around the construction of, of new paths and the, the fear that that can be detrimental to the ornithological tourism that the island so greatly depends on. So uh, I, I, I would be keen to see an application from that area for this fund. The story for a supplementary. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Minister, for that. And can can I also ask, following on from that, will he, as he alluded to in turn, or was was que uh, questioned by my colleague, Mr. Campbell, will his department be actively involved in ensuring that communities, such as Rathlin, do engage in this process? And that, given the current issues which currently prevail and the concerns that there are with some on the island, that everything will be done to ensure that Rathlin maintains and is built upon as one of the most idyllic parts of the United Kingdom and somewhere where every member of this House should visit, including the Minister. And I invite him to join with me on a visit to their island in Rathlin. I'll certainly go to Rathlin. I don't know if I'll go with me. <laughs> no. I, I, I can uh, assure the member that my staff will uh, follow this option up with uh, those charged with the tourism development on Rathlin. I can assure the member also that currently my NIEA staff are liaising with and working very closely uh, with uh, people on Rathlin Island on this very issue, and I have quite a bit of correspondence to prove it. <laughs> Well, Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Explorers in Port of Ferry, the Minister, his staff, Arts Council, Friends of Explorers, and indeed many other people have been working extremely hard to secure the future of this wonderful regional aquarium. Can the Minister advise the Assembly of what progress has been made to date to keep this, uh, this facility uh, open? I thank uh, the, the member for the question and commend him for his. I suppose determination to see Explorers saved. He, like me, and like hopefully many in this house, recognise the importance of Explorers to our, 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 our uh, tourism product here in the north, but particularly to the members' constituency. Indeed, I, I referred earlier to the fact that I had been in the United States a few weeks ago, but I came across a brochure promoting Northern Ireland, and Explorers had pride of place. I think on page seven of that brochure. Uh, progress has been made, despite those out there who think it hasn't, and a lot of work has been done. I, I appreciate that the member recognises that, although progress, unfortunately, has been slower than we would have liked. My uh, officials have been liaising very closely and very laboriously with uh, officials from the Council and also the Friends of Explorers particularly around the business case that I have asked for. This is a business case that I have asked for that I can then, in turn, take to the executive and ask or seek uh, financial assistance for explorers from the executive. In, in my opinion, there are still a couple of outstanding issues or questions around that business case. For me to bring to my colleagues, I want it to be as robust as possible. And following a meeting with uh, the member and some representatives or, or councillors from the area last week, I'm confident that uh, those questions will be answered and gaps filled in the coming days. Mr. McCarthy, for a supplementary. I, I, I sincerely thank the minister for his update and welcome his determination to see explorers, explorers for, flourish uh, into the future. Uh, when it does come to the assembly, can the minister encourage? Uh, sorry, when it does come to the executive table, can the minister encourage the Derry minister uh, to recognise Explorers as a premier tourist destination and attraction and seek her assistance uh, from the department um, to really promote Explorers well into the future? Well, I, I, I believe that the Explorers is a tremendous facility. It's tremendous for tourism. It's tremendous for education, and uh, obviously it has a fine environmental aspect to it as well. That's why I have, outside of the business case process, given a commitment to fund all reasonable costs associated with the seal sanctuary uh, at Explorers. 
and that's, like I say, outside of, 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 of the business case process. When I do present the business case, I will be raising the points that, that the member has uh, iterated in the House today. I do believe that it, it has tremendous tourism potential. I believe that the minister responsible for tourism must believe that as well. Otherwise, it would not be adorning glossy brochures in other parts of the world that, that, that are promoting Northern Ireland as a tourism destination. And therefore, I believe it is certainly worthy of her and other ministers' support. Mr. Paul Gervin is not in this place, so I call Mr. George Robinson. <coughs> uh, Mr. Deputy, Deputy Speaker, would the minister support the DVA staff being given local priority and redeployment within the Northern Ireland Civil Service? <coughs> uh, thank the member for the question. I do and I will support DVA staff in any way I, I, I possibly can. I have uh, written to all executive colleagues asking them to look for what opportunities might exist for redeployment for of the staff, but more importantly, redeployment of work to Coleraine, a relocation of work to Coleraine, given the immobility of many of the grades currently employed there. I have also prepared, in advance of our next executive meeting, a paper with my colleague, the Minister for Finance and Personnel, uh, outlining the situation throughout the DVA, most notably in Coleraine, and the need for us as an executive to take action to assist those affected immediately. Robinson for supplementary. Uh, <clears throat> Mr Deputy Speaker, if the worst comes to the worst, can the Minister let us know what will happen to the building, DVA building in Coleraine. I'm not sure I'm in a position to, to, to give an answer to that. Uh, if the, the worst comes to the worst, I think we, we, what has happened is, is nearly the, the, the worst thus far. But as of yet, I have no future plans for that building. But I'll be fighting for the workers and for them to stay in that building as long as possible. Uh, Gorham, I've got a brief last question. Uh, could I ask the Minister, um, has he made any preparations within his department for any potential transfer of DVA responsibilities to his department? Uh, the, uh, I would uh, answer that question by saying yes, as had my predecessor. We have both made a representation and uh, have correspondence to prove it with uh, our counterparts in, in Westminster. However, it seems like we are hitting a brick wall on that one. There is no appetite there for them to devolve it, and I am not sure of the appetite here. I am not speaking, talking about right here where I am standing, but I am not sure of the, the, the appetite here within uh, this assembly, actually, and, this, and in Northern Ireland to have it devolved. I was going based on IRA, as if the I thank the Minister for his answer there. But does the Minister agree with me that in order to save the jobs, he must pursue this continually with the British Government? And will he do, uh, commit to do that, doing that? Well, uh, we have been trying everything that we can to save these jobs for some time now, both myself and my predecessor. And I think that's something that's recognised by the staff there and something that has actually been applauded by the, the, the staff there. It is an option I will continue to pursue. However, what the staff do not want to see is people actually playing politics with this issue. Order. Uh, time is up.